On today's episode of Water Cooler Weekly, we are joined by mental health professional Brian Jeffrey. Brian talks about his personal journey from Scotland to Australia and specifically the moment that changed his career trajectory. He speaks about the work he does around mental health training and his love for ice hockey, which has led him to not only expand on his work in mental health, but has taken him to places in the world that he may not have seen happening. Mental health is such an important subject right now, and I really encourage those who are in need of help to reach out and speak to the people who can help, like Brian. His details and information will be attached and available for those who may need them. As always, thank you for listening, and please enjoy this episode with Brian. Pleasure now to welcome on the director of Moat Mental Health Services, Brian Jeffrey. Brian, thank you so much for joining me today. Absolute pleasure, Chris. Cheers. No, the pleasure is all mine. I guess the where we'll start off. Born in Dundee, Scotland. How does Brian find himself in Victoria now? I, I know it's uh, it beggars belief, really. So, yeah, born in Dundee, 1966. Um, didn't really spend much time in Dundee as a family. We moved um, down south a little bit um, in between Glasgow and Edinburgh. Spent most of my time, most of my childhood. Um, so I think at the age of four, my mum and dad split up. So I ended up living with mum. So there was um, there was eventually four kids um, with mum, uh, which was a tough gig, really. Uh, mum bringing up four difficult kids, three difficult kids, one angel, four difficult kids. Um, so angel, obviously. Obviously, so mum mum was a school teacher, um, and she was actually my school teacher for a while. Which kind of that's a bit of a, a brain spinner that one. Um, you know, when you come home from school and your parents say, "Have you done your homework?" and you say, oh, "I've not got any homework," and she says, "Well, you have because I gave you." It. Yeah, <laughs> so, there's a there's uh, a loophole already gone. <laughs> it was fun. Um, so for for quite a long time, mum was a single parent. Um, She was working all around that kind of central band of Scotland between Glasgow and Edinburgh. So wherever mum was working, that was kind of where we were living as a family. Um, And then I I suppose one of the the landmark things for me that happened was I I was on a trajectory at school to be doing kind of not bad, going to university. I was going to go to university and be a a scientist or work work as a chemist or something like that. But then 1982, when I was 16 years old, I had a motorbike accident. Uh, so I was, I was riding a little, like what you guys would call a posty bike over here, a little kind of moped daft little thing. And I had my pool cue strapped on the, the side of it, going down to the local pub to play some pool at the age of 16. And I came out this junction onto the main road and this clown was coming down the wrong side of the road and just absolutely wiped me out. So I spent, I don't know how long I spent in hospital, quite a long time. Um, but one of the funny things was the, the rumour that was going around the town. So the town we were living in was called Denny. And my, my name was Tiny. Right? They called me Tiny at school. The rumour that was going around Denny was that Tiny died. Tiny died in a car accident. <laughs> so, <laughs> not a um, <laughs> so that wasn't great. Um, a, a few weeks after I was released from hospital, I remember clearly walking down the street. And this guy, Willie Wells, I think his name was, came up the street and looked at me and did a second take. And he says, I thought you were dead. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently not, Willie. <laughs> um, so so that, that kind of changed my, my pathway quite significantly. I wasn't able to finish school because that was all happening around about the time of exams. You know, my second yeah. last year in school. No, actually my last year in school. So I wasn't able to set the exams and, you know, the, the whole kind of plan changed. And then I got offered... <laughs> what they called in Scotland and the UK, a youth training scheme, which is kind of like an apprenticeship, but it's more like slave labor, where (laughs) you you get employed, so to speak, and they give you you enough money for a Mars bar, you know, as your salary. Um, But when I was told that I was going to get, whatever it was, 30 pounds a week or something like that, for a young kid that didn't get much pocket money, I was thinking, wow, it's like being a millionaire. (laughs) 
Yeah. So I let go of the whole university idea. I uh, went to do this youth training scheme as a, an office clerk, they called it, which was kind of sitting in an office doing really boring stuff. Um, the bosses found out that I wasn't really good at that. Um, so, so they trained me to be a tire fitter, right? So these big industrial tires, big enormous things off the big earth movers. So I became a tire fitter for a while, and then a forklift driver for a while, and then a warehouseman for a while. And then they decided that I wasn't very good at those things either. So uh, <laughs> they sent me to the equivalent of TAFE uh, to go and learn some trades. So they, they had me doing plumbing, carpentry, bricklaying, and all, all these other things that I really wasn't interested in. And then I got sacked. Um, so <laughs> it, was, um, it was a big haulage firm, right? It's a trucking firm. And uh, there was this old guy. When I say old, probably the age I am just now, there was this old guy who was a mechanic and he pulled one of the big trucks into the warehouse to do a service on it, smashing the bejesus out of the underneath of it, getting all the, the dirt off and all the mud off and fixing things. When he finished the, the job, he, he drove the truck out and he turned around to me and said, hey, Brian, clean up. And I said, oh, his name was Bob. I says, what do you mean, Bob? And he says, well, clean up, get the brush and clean out all the dirt. And I says, why? He says, because I'm telling you. I says, but you made the mess, Bob. I didn't make the mess. And he says, no, but you're the YTS. You'll be cleaning it up. And I says, you can go and shove that idea, more or less. <laughs> so very shortly, I ended up at the CEO's office, <laughs> getting the dressing down of, uh, how dare you speak up? Uh, so they kicked me into touch. I got kicked out of the YTS, um, youth training scheme. I, I can't remember why, but I ended up working in the motor trade. I must have seen an advert or something for a job in the motor trade. So I was doing, I did a little bit of mechanics, but it was mostly selling parts for cars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I did that in a small garage. And then I moved through to a bigger garage that did Austin Rover cars. Um, that would have been round about 1986 I moved. So it's that, I'm about 20 years old, something like that. And that's actually where ice hockey started. That's where the ice hockey story commences. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Hopefully you were good at ice hockey because every role you've had <laughs> seems you were no good at it. <laughs> I was really good at being an ice hockey fan. Yeah. Now, anybody that knows me from the Mustangs or any of the Melbourne Ice fans that know me will probably know that I'm a little bit barbed about the mouth and I don't mind doing a little bit of, a little bit of sarcasm in the stands. Um, Working in the motor trade in Edinburgh, yeah, so it's 1986-ish. One of my mates, Budgie, that I worked with, um, Billy Burgess was his name, but we call him Budgie. Um, Budgie had said to me, fancy coming and watching an ice hockey match at the weekend. And I says, what's ice hockey? And he says, oh, you'll love it. He says, there's a lot of fighting. And I said, oh, I'll get enough of that at the football. <laughs> and he said, no, no, the actual players do the fighting. Nobody fights in the crowd. And I says, oh, sounds ideal. So went along to the Saturday match, the Murrayfield Racers. Can't remember who they were playing, um, but there was a fight. At like halfway through the game, there was this big fight where everybody's kind of getting into each other on the ice. And I was looking at it, thinking, "Oh, this is good." Yeah. And I was looking around the crowd. The opposition crowd were they were there, and they were shouting, and I was shouting, and everybody else was shouting. But they weren't shouting at each other. You know, they were shouting at the players. And I, I've always liked that about ice hockey, that, you know, there's so much energy, let's call yeah. it, on the ice, but it hardly ever spills out in the crowd. Mm -hmm. You know, even, even at a Melbourne Mustangs, Melbourne Ice Derby game, when I'm running my mouth off like an idiot, um, or when we're at Canberra, CBR, CBR's a great rink to go to. Yeah. It's probably one of the worst rinks in the Southern Hemisphere. It's disgraceful, but, it, but in terms to, of atmosphere, it's, in, it's insane. Go, oh, yeah. And, and they, wear, they wear tartan. The, the CBR fans wear tartan, which is obviously kind of cool for me. But we are, we are mouthing off each other. <laughs> and at the end of the game, they come over and they congratulate or, you know, hang, hang the crap on us. <laughs> but, it, but it's all very friendly at the end. So yeah. that was the thing in 1986 that really captured me about hockey. I thought, you know what, this is a game for me. So I was bitten by the bug. Uh, myself and Budgie. Uh, and a couple of other guys, Deacon Dodd were the guys' names. We used to travel up and down the UK every weekend following the Murrayfield Racers. Mm -hmm. So I can't remember which way around it was. I think Saturday was the away game and Sunday was the home game from memory. So on Saturday we'd be in 
I don't know, south of England, <laughs> watching the hockey, drive up overnight, go to Edinburgh on a Sunday and watch the home game. And that was um, every weekend, pretty much during the hockey season. So that, that was where the, the hockey thing started. Mm-hmm. Um, round about that time, I, I was getting kind of disillusioned with the whole motor trade thing. You know, I, I just felt like I was, I was going in the morning, clocking in, taking my brain out, putting it on a shelf, going and doing what I had to do, come back at five o'clock, put the brain back in, clock out and go home. You know, it just didn't feel like it was testing me at all. Yeah. And I know there was this, um, this night I was coming home from, from Glasgow with my mate Ronnie. He was driving. I happened to be in the back of the car with a girl that I think her name's Leslie Fleming, I think. Certainly Leslie, I think it was Leslie Fleming. And she's maybe an occupational therapist or something like that. And she's very attractive. So I'm sitting there chatting to her, and uh, single at the time, of course. Yeah, uh, hopefully Leslie there, listens to this. <laughs> sitting there <laughs> chatting to her, and um, she said to me, what do you do for a job, Brian? And I saw a motor trade. And she said, do you like it? I said, no, nah, I hate it. And she says, why don't you do something else? And I thought, oh, there's an idea. <laughs> and I said, I said, like what? I says, what do you do? And she says, oh, I work in mental health. And anything that Leslie said here is going to be fascinating to me, right, obviously. Yes. I said, oh, men- mental health. That was very interesting. Mm-hmm. You know, about a month later, I started my course to be a psychiatric nurse. Uh, Fort Valley College of Nursing Midwifery, September uh, 1992. I was starting to be a psych nurse. Leslie, made, based. A, Leslie made a very big impact. <laughs> And that, that was the end of the Leslie story, I have to face into that. Yeah. <laughs> there, was, there was no more depth to that story apart from yeah. that she opened the door, you know, and I'm a big fan of fate. I really like that kind of thing. Yeah. You know, when something happens like that and the door's open and you think, ah, why not? Let's yeah, have it's a o- it's open now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Might as well have a look. <laughs> <laughs> have a look in there and see what's happening. So potentially one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life was to become a psych nurse. My mentality changed then. I, I really became a different person, totally different person. So I finished my psych nursing degree in 95, the end of 95, and then did various kind of psych nursing jobs. I've always worked with kids. Kids is really my, my client group. So um, <laughs> another story. Um, when I was a student, I think it was my last placement as a student, uh, I had a placement at Child and Adolescent Psych. Right? It's a Child and Adolescent Psychiatry as a student nurse. And my charge nurse was a wonderful woman called Lorna McGilvery, um, who drove a Land Rover Discovery, which was all very fancy back in the day. Um, and I just fell in love with the job. Lorna was fantastic. I loved the way she went about her work. And I just thought, you know what? Working with kids. You know, the people actually pay you to work with kids. <laughs> it seems so easy. So then I started working with kids who'd been abused. You know, so kids who'd been sexually abused at home, removed from home, put into the care sector. So residential care, foster care, that kind of thing. And I just loved it. You know, I loved being able to do something with these kids that had the potential to, I, I don't know, help them to change direction or something like that. So for 25 years, since 1995, that's been my client group, really, mm-hmm. working with kids in care. Just absolutely adored it. So how, how I came to Australia, really, was um, shortly after that, 1998. Um, I had a day off work. I'd been looking in the, the local newspaper. I don't know if you remember newspapers. I do. Um, I but, still read, I read them on weekends, <laughs> actually. Yeah. Looking I'm, in I'm the newspaper. I'm looking bored now in public now that we can go back out. <laughs> You don't want to be doing it on a phone. No. no. Paper. Um, so there was this migration consultant who uh, was coming to Edinburgh, an Australian migration consultant. And I thought, Australia, the land of milk and honey, why not? You know, so I, in Scotland, you know, Australia's there is, it's like a beacon of what you could have had. You know, it's like a tropical paradise. Can I? That's exactly and, what I call Australia. <laughs> yeah. Tropical it's, paradise. It's amazing. I don't know if you've ever been to Scotland, but Australia is totally different. Um, so, I mean, all the information, joking aside, all the information we had about Australia was home and away, <laughs> Crocodile Dundee and that neighbours thing. You know, that, that, was, that was the extent of the tourist information in the, the late 90s. But I thought, you know what, I fancy it. I really, really fancy it. So I went and had a chat with this guy, migration consultant in a big hotel in Edinburgh. 
So I went in and introduced myself and he said, so what, what's the gig, Brian? Why Australia? And I said, oh, I've never really thought about it before. I just saw your advert and thought I'd come and chat to you. And he says, what do you do for a job? I said, I'm a psych nurse. And he says, oh, you're in. He says, at your age, psych nurse, you're in. If you want to go, they'll take you. He but says, obviously, like, people. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to steal anything anymore. You, know, you just have to be a psych nurse. Um, so I, I said to him, what's the process? And he says, well, I do all the paperwork for you and charge this amount of money. I'm thinking it was something disgusting, like £3,000, which is about six grand yeah. in, in dollars. But that, that was back then, even more than that now. It's a disgusting amount of money to take off me to do some paperwork. Uh, but I fell for it anyway. And I said to him, yeah, so, sounds good, mate. Let's go for that. And he says, well, why don't you go away and think about it? He says, and then when I go back to Holland, because he was based in Holland, when I go back to Holland, I'll contact you and see what you think. I said, no, no, go for it. Get it started. And he said, you know what to think about this? I said, no, no, go for it. What do you need? He says, well, you need to give me a deposit. So I got my checkbook out and wrote my deposit. <laughs> there you go. And then he was, he was kind of shaking his head because apparently people don't do it as impulsively as that normally. So then I'm driving back home, stopped off at my mum's house for a cup of tea, which was a, a regular thing for me. So mum gets a kettle on, cup of tea, a couple of biscuits. And she says, so where have you been? I said, I've been in Edinburgh. And she says, oh, was it an ice hockey thing? Because that's where the racers played. I says, no, no. I said, I went to see a migration consultant about emigrating to Australia. And she said, no, really, what did you, what were you going to Edinburgh for? I said, no, really, that's the gig. And she said, so why? And I says, well, why not? I says, my wife, whose name is Robin, it's probably still is Robin, I would imagine. <laughs> and my, my then wife and I had, um, had just separated and got divorced. And I had just finished a job and about to look and get in a new job. And I'd always thought about moving house, you know, from the little town that I was in. And, and all these planets were just lining up for me. And I thought, why not have a crack at it? So my mum supported me, of course, because she's gorgeous. And says, yeah, yeah, go for it, Brian. Why not? Why not? Um, well, I made the deposit. <laughs> so it took a couple of years, the process. You know, people have said to me since, well, that was very brave. No, it wasn't. It was reckless and impulsive. It wasn't brave at all. Um, I mean, if you understand the migration process, you start the process and it just runs. Mm -hmm. And you either get in or you don't get in. You know, there's, there's no fancy kind of decision making that, get, that happens as part of it. So I arrived, 20th of September 2000, I arrived. And I had, um, I had an apartment that I was renting on um, St Kilda Road next door to the cop shop. Um, at Albert Park, kind of end of St Kilda Road. Lovely apartment. Um, I had also hooked up with this guy online on a message board somewhere. And his name was Peter something, but his, his tagline, his, his kind of handle, so to speak, was Larrikin. Um, and I'd kind of hooked up with him online and he was telling me all about Melbourne and motorbikes and all the rest of it because I'm a big motorbike fan. And he'd, he'd offered to pick me up from my apartment and take me to a motorbike shop in Box Hill called Mickey Hones. Um, so I'd managed to get an apartment. I'd managed to get somebody to give me a lift to go and pick up this new, what was it, a Wild Star or a Road Star, I think it's called, Yamaha XV1600 V-Twin, kind of Harley Davidson kind of thing. So I would purchased that online um, and it was ready for me the day I arrived. So flew in at something like five o'clock in the morning sat about the airport for a few hours, um, waiting to go and get the keys in Melbourne CBD to then get to the apartment. So I did all that. Larrikin had organised to pick me up at whatever, 10 o'clock, 10.30 at the apartment. He drove me out in his post Boxster, don't you know, to Mickey Hones in Box Hill to pick up this motorbike. So I picked up the motorbike, bought a helmet, bought a leather jacket. <laughs> and then um, I thought, shit, how did I get back? How do you get? How do you get back to Albert Park from here? I've got absolutely no idea. A lot so of I'm on this behaviour in your first day. <laughs> <laughs> reckless and stuff. Yeah. So I said to the guy, I said it was actually Mickey Hone, the guy that owns the shop that's over the bank. I said, "How'd you go back to St Kilda Road, Albert Park?" And he said, "Brian, it's kind of that way." I'm like, yeah, okay. So he says, "You got the number thirty-four road, which is what is that?" 
is that we're in the highway or something like that? I can't remember. And you turn left on Albert Road or something like that. I'm here, yeah, yeah, fine. So I eventually got back to the apartment, parked my bike up on the grass verge as you do in Melbourne. Uh, went into the apartment. The apartment is completely empty, right? No, no furniture, completely empty. And by now it's like early afternoon. And I'm thinking, where am I sleeping? I've, I've not got a bed. I've bought a bike first. I've not got a fridge. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there, there was light bulbs, you know, and the power was on and the gas and the water was on, so that was kind of cool. I thought, what do you do? I grabbed, I think it was maybe four beach towels and a couple of pillows or something. I think that's all I got. Um, walked, walked back down to Kilda Road <laughs> like a homeless guy. Um, got to the apartments. I kind of was a homeless guy, I suppose. Got to the apartment, went in. And, and started making up my bed, and I thought, I, I need to have food. And now, thankfully, right across the, the road, St Kilda Road from where I was, there's a subway on the corner. Yes, yeah, I kind of love subways. So I went over there and got a meatball sandwich, of course, because that's my standard, and a Coca-Cola. And I came back over, and I thought, Brian, you have potentially made the worst decision in your life. What on earth were you thinking? Now... I don't know if you know about stress, being a mental health worker, can I get a bit of an idea of stress, yeah? I really don't like spiders. I uh, really yeah. don't like spiders. So I decided to emigrate to Australia. You came to the right place. <laughs> At least I didn't turn up in Sydney. Um, yeah. So I, I put out my stuff on the floor and I, I kind of made a little pillow with one of the beach towels and blankie over the top of another beach towel. And then I started thinking about spiders and thinking, what, what if there's loads of spiders here? What if I wake up in the morning and you know the way your stressy mind kind of runs away and goes off on a tangent and starts yeah. with all these conspiracy theories? I had this vision of waking up in the morning with huntsmen, you know, laying eggs in my ear canals. You know, it was just crazy, crazy thinking. Um, but thankfully, I, I actually I cried myself to sleep that night. I have no, kind of, no, no qualms telling you that. I, did I cried that every myself second to sleep night. that night and thought, what have I done? This is potentially the stupidest thing I've ever done in my life. And, and that's saying something because there's been some stupid stuff in the history. So day two, I, I woke up and I felt a lot better because there was no spiders. And then I, I did a bit of search on the interweb and, and found this place in maybe a Turak, Turak Road or somewhere like that, or out towards there, maybe Commercial Road, that, that does rental furniture. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, I'll go out and speak to these guys. And I, I said, so what's the chances of me getting a whole house of rental furniture from you? And the, the guy's eyes just lit up and he says, we could sell you some ex-rental stuff if you want. I said, yeah, put me down for some of that. So, <laughs> and, and bearing in mind that the currency was in my favour at that time. You know, you're, you're Australian dollars. You, know, you could get a million of them for five pence. You know, the, the Australian dollar currency was really, really good back then. Felt like a millionaire. So I, I went round with this guy in his rental kind of shop thing and, and just bought loads of furniture. And I, I said to him, uh, can you deliver it? <laughs> he said, I'll deliver it this afternoon. Um, so I, I gave him um, the, the guy's phone number that looks after the apartment block. Spoke to that guy to let him in and let all the, you know, get all the furniture in and all the rest of it. And I jumped on this motorbike of mine. And I thought, I'm going to go down the Great Ocean Road. Because it kind of looks good, looks good on the internet. Uh, I didn't realise it's it's a bit of a journey getting to the Great Ocean Road. Yeah, <laughs> so I think I, I think I got as I got as far as Torquay or something, and I thought oh, I'm kind of over this and rode the bike back again. So that was day one and two in Australia. I, I kind of liked it. It was um, it was nice, and and I'd also I'd given myself a a three month window. I'd, so I arrived September twentieth, and I thought by Christmas. I need to make a decision about whether I want to live here or not. Mm -hmm. So I was on a permanent residency visa, so I could stay for as long as I wanted. But I thought by Christmas, I need to make a decision. And I'll also need to have a job by Christmas, really, or I'll run out of cash. Um, yeah, to so, start being a millionaire. Yeah, <laughs> a fake millionaire. Um, so it was, it was going up to Christmas and I thought, oh, 
I'm meant to be making a, a decision just now about where I want to live. So because Australia had been so wonderful and the local community had been so welcoming, Scottish guy, um, you know, pe people were just falling over themselves, being nice, just being really, really nice. Um, so I made some friends through the motorbike thing. There was this uh, motorbike club. It was called the Virago Club or something like that out in Werribee. Um, so they were all going about in kind of, kind of fake Harley Cruiser kind of things, which was kind of like my bike. So I hooked up with those guys and kind of hung about with them for a few years. Um, but that, that really helped me to understand, you know, the culture in Melbourne and that whole thing about, you know, people that live west of the Westgate Bridge never come over the bridge and mm -hmm. people that live in the, the leafy eastern suburbs think that they own the world and, you know, Mount Dandenong's really nice. So I, I learned <laughs> all that kind of cultural stuff. <laughs> Um, so then, hockey. Yeah. I thought, I, I, no, I'd never skated. Right? I was one of the biggest hockey fans in, in Edinburgh, right? So I claimed ice hockey. Ice hockey daft for, for about 14 years before I left. Um, I, I'd never skated. And I arrived in Australia and I thought, maybe I could start playing hockey. You know, I, I could be like Tony Hand, right? So Tony Hand was the, the guy from the UK that set the world alight in ice hockey. He was one of the Murrayfield Racers players, yeah. And at the age of 16, he's playing top-level UK hockey, getting twice as many points per game as any of the imports. Now, this, this guy was just an ice hockey genius, absolute mm -hmm. legend. Actually, Tony Hand, have a look at elite prospects, Tony Hand's numbers. Mm -hmm. 16, 17, 18-year-old kids just blowing it out of the park. So I thought, I could be like Tony you know, forgetting that I'm an old man at this point. Um, so I, I looked up ice hockey and there wasn't really much ice hockey happening at the time, but there was inline hockey happening um, at maybe Campbellfield. Or was it Sunshine maybe? Can't remember. I think Campbellfield sounds right. Campbellfield. I, yeah, it was Campbellfield. Yeah, it was Campbellfield. It's that one just off the ring road. And I went up there and I, I got told to catch up with a guy called Nifty. Nifty. Really good hockey player, can't remember his name. Um, but he was one of the coaches, a young guy. So I went up there with a inline skates and uh, kind of tried my best. So he he was the first guy that taught me how to skate pretty much. So I started skating a little bit. But I think it was my first year as a D when I was playing there that I fell over and did that stupid thing that people do when they're falling over playing hockey, where I put my hand down. <laughs> And the wrist just went ping yeah. and snapped. So that was me out for about six months with a broken wrist. The right, the right hand, of course. Yeah, the, the dominant hand. Perfect. You don't really need that. Yeah. No, have, having a shave with your left hand is a fun thing. <laughs> you know, buttoning up a shirt with your left hand is a fun thing. And various other things. Yeah. Um, so, uh, <laughs> like tying up laces. Yeah, of course. Um, I always so forget that. When I came back from that, I thought, you know what, I, I don't think being a D is really the gig for me. And we were playing, I think, three-line hockey at the time. And one of the things that really annoyed me was you paid the full amount for the game, but you only played a third of the game. And mm -hmm. I, I don't want to get too cliched with Scots and being tight with their money and all that stuff. But I, I just thought return on investment, I could be a goalie. You get to stay out there for the whole game. And you're kind of hero and villain at the same time. <laughs> And and you get a little bit more latitude from the referees to hit people, I find, as a goalie than you do as a D. And I thought, this this is just, this is a position for me. I thought, how hard could it be? God, it's hard. <laughs> tough, <laughs> tough kick. So I started playing in goals probably around about then, end of 2001, 2002, something like that. Loved it. So I think my first team was the mother puckers that I, I transitioned from. So... <laughs> I started playing D uh, with them, but then I transitioned into goalie when I came back after the broken wrist. I never looked back, to be perfectly honest. Um, I love it. Mm -hmm. I absolutely adore being a goalie. It's fantastic. So that, that was really where the, the ice hockey concept started. It was in line at the time, but that was where the ice hockey kind of, I could actually be a hockey player thing started. Mm -hmm. um, so what's that? 2001. It's now 2020. So 19 years later, I'm still a very average ice hockey goalie. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm okay with that. I'm okay. You know, there's been some kind of cool stuff over the journey. Yeah. Um, 
I think 2008 was probably the start of me being kind of okay. You know, so like, you know, being a, a big a big fish in a small pool kind of thing. Um, there weren't an awful lot of goalies in my age group at that time in Victoria. There's maybe about, you know, four or five kind of serious-ish goalies in my age group. So when it came to the, the Victorian um, state championship kind of thing, in the Masters division, there was only a few of us that were of that age range. And there was probably only one or two of us that were actually interested in playing for the state. You know, so, you know, if you could afford to go to the state competition and you were the right age group and you knew which pad to put on which leg, you kind of got the gig. So there was me yeah, and yeah. Colin. Me and Colin. What's Colin's surname? Can't remember his name. So me and Colin kind of did the, the double act for a while um, as the, the Vic goalies in that Masters kind of age range. Um, I got... I got picked to be on the Australian team a few times, which I thought was actually pretty cool. Um, so in the Vic team, I think we did a competition in Caloundra, did a competition in Springvale, I'm going to say. Springers. Mm-hmm. Springers, I think it was called. Um, I don't think I played in the competition that Ice HQ had. Uh, sorry, Puck Handlers then had. Um, but then the Australian team, um, we went to Perth for a comp. Went to New Zealand, New Plymouth, I think it was called, um, which was great fun. And then we went to the Czech Republic. Mm -hmm. Got to play in the Czech Republic against guys that could actually play hockey. You know, we were, um, I think it was Bruno or something it's called, was the actual place where the competition was. And we were living at at accommodation in uh, Prague. Um, So that, that was 2011, I think. In 2010, I, I had met my, my present partner, my wife, Deb. And uh, Deb and I had started living together in about 2010 with Deb's kids. So Deb, Deb's got two kids that now live with us. So in 2010, Paddy was at seven, Georgia was about 10. And um, we decided we're all going to live together in my house in Warrandyte. So we set up a new family home in Warrandyte. And um, the kids thought they were coming to live with a funny Scottish guy with a nice car. They didn't realise that I specialised in challenging behaviour of children for 25 years. <laughs> Poor little buggers didn't see this coming. Um, so we've got the strictest house. <laughs> strictest house in the Southern Hemisphere. Yeah. There's an awful lot of love, obviously, mm-hmm. but kind of strict. So in 2011, it was Deb and I that, that went over to the Czech Republic. So we went to the Czech Republic and Paddy and Georgia got to spend some time at their dad's house and Points Cook, Point Cook. So I thought that was a fair trade-off. They go to Point Cook, we go to the Czech Republic. What a wonderful competition. Played against Italy. And it was like serious hockey players played against the Czech Republic, did they? Yeah, I think they played against the Czech team. And there were guys on that team that had played serious ice hockey. Mm -hmm. Uh, Played the Scottish team as well, so I swapped jerseys at the end of the competition, the Scottish goalie, who was actually a goalie that I admired Mm -hmm. as an ice hockey goalie back in Scotland. Um, but what, what you didn't see, you know, if you just went to the competition um, in Bruno and, and you saw everybody playing hockey and you thought it was kind of serious, what you didn't see was the Scottish inline hockey masters team after that. Now, I, I, I don't know if I can get done for slander or something like that. But oh, we can edit it out. Have a, no, I'll keep it in. It's okay. Have a yeah. crack at it. I wasn't um, going to take it out. So, the Scottish team were as drunk as drunk people full of drunkness the whole holiday. That's where and, they and they, for Scottish people. And they, well, just those ones. This Scottish guy wasn't because I, yeah. I don't drink. Right? So, this Scottish guy was sober. Um, but they were, every night they were drunk as hell. And, and they were coming in the next day, obviously hung over, but still playing kind of pretty good hockey. Um, but, you know, what we, we did really well. The Australian team over there did really well against that, that kind of level of opposition. But, you know, Masters inline hockey, yeah, it's, it's, it's Masters. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's not really that serious. But, you know, I, I've just adored that journey. Being a hockey player, um, a very mediocre goalie, I, I hasten to add, has been absolutely fantastic for me. Um, it's obviously opened up the door for the Mustangs, which we'll go on and talk about at some point, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, I, I suppose the transition from inline to ice 
must have started around about 2009. So before Deb and I got together. Now, 2009 is also a kind of landmark year for me because uh, 7th of February, 2009, um, I was living up in King Lake with my, my then partner and um, we, we had left the house on 7th of February because it was going to be a stinking day, 43 mm -hmm. degrees or something like that. We didn't have air conditioning. So we went to see three back-to-back, -back, very average movies at uh, Doncaster Shopping Town. Um, when we came out at the end of the movies, we looked up onto the, the mountains and saw the mountains were ablaze. And I turned to my partner and I says, oh, Dandenongs have gone up again. And she says, no, that's our house, that's King Lake. Yeah. So the, the bushfires came through, as you'll be aware. And we lost everything in the bushfires. We lost the house, we lost the dogs, we lost our, our vehicles all our possessions. And, and one of the gorgeous things about the Victorian, the Australian, the international community was how fantastic they were at the end of that. You know, mm -hmm. the, the way you guys supported us was unbelievable. It was just, I was just reinforcing everything that I love about Australia. You know, for, for example, a couple of days after the, the bushfire, um, we, I'd, I'd driven up. <laughs> I'd managed to get past the police and driven up to the house to see what was happening. And it was all just ash. Um, and I thought, right, okay, no clothes. <laughs> Could be kind of cool to go and get some clothes. So I went down to Moorabbin to the DFO, Direct Factory Outlet or whatever it is. And I went into, I think it was a Bonds shop, first of all. And I just went in and said, I need loads of boxer shorts and loads of socks and loads of t-shirts. <laughs> and, and she heard the Scottish accent. She says, oh, you just arrived from Scotland waiting on your luggage coming. I says, no, no. I says, I lost a house in the bushfire the other day. And her face just went white. Mm. And she turned around to me and she says, you know what, mate? Fill the trolley. Fill the trolley, take whatever you want. We're not charging you. Mm. That's just the most gorgeous thing. And then maybe two or three shops thereafter that went into, you know, I, I didn't go in and say, can I get stuff for nothing? I've been in the bushfire. But, you know, the, in, in conversation, some of them asked me, you know, have you just come over from Scotland and chitty, chitty, chit chat, and they came up. And, and these people were just throwing clothes at me, saying, please mm. take them. Um, I, I contacted the, uh, the, the hockey goalie uh, manufacturer, Brian's, uh, back in Canada. And I said, I need new gear. I've, I've lost my stuff in the bushfires. You've never heard of the bushfires. And they, they sent me over gear free of charge and said, take it. What size yeah. are you? <laughs> and yeah. sent me over a set of hockey gears. You know, just absolutely gorgeous. And and one of the big things in 2009 that really blew my mind was I got a phone call from Germany. Right now, my then partner, her, her mum is from Germany. Um, it's this guy phones me from Germany, and I'm not going to do the German accent because that's disrespectful and I can't do it properly. But he yeah. said, "Hello, is that Brian?" Uh, I said, "Yeah. How can I help you?" Thinking that it was a a more mental health services kind of international call. They want me to go over and do some training for them. I said, yeah, how can I help you? And he said, you don't know me. My name is whatever, Hans, whatever. He says, I heard that you lost everything in the bushfire. I'm so sorry, Brian. And I just wanted to reach out and communicate with you and tell you how sorry I am about what you experienced in the bushfire. I said, oh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm touched. That's a gorgeous thing to do. Mm -hmm. And he said, he said and that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Goodbye. Click. <laughs> it was a kind of sudden end to the conversation. Yeah. Real heartwarming kind of thing. You know, so 2009, that, that was a, a kind of big turnaround. So, you know, Deb and I got together 2010, um, became the wicked stepdad, as we call me in the, the family. Um, and then in 2010, that was my introduction to the AIHL. Mm -hmm. How did this happen? I don't know if you know John Bellick. Uh, John mm -hmm. Bellick, the president of the Mustangs. Him and I were playing hockey together. I think it must have been the night owls or something like that. So we're, we're sitting in the change room with a couple of old guys sweating profusely before the game. That was just putting the gear on, yeah? <laughs> and, and he was chatting to me and saying, <laughs> he was chatting to me and saying, uh, hey, Brian, get a new team kind of starting up Melbourne Mustangs. Are you interested in kind of helping out? And I says, well, you know, I've actually I've finished with Melbourne now, so yeah, why not, John? And he said, well, we've got this exhibition season, but then we're going to go into the real season 2011. 
would you be interested in sponsoring this 2011? Just for a season? I said, yeah, why not? So gave some money, got a bit of a sponsorship package for one season. 2011, one season. 2020, still a sponsor of Melbourne Masters. <laughs> John's a really good salesman. Yeah. Yeah. It could it sell helps, snow to it estimates. Helps, yeah. it, it, it doesn't do too bad. At, at the end of every season, I remember thinking, gee, that was a lot of money yeah. you know, for some season tickets you know? <laughs> and, and frame jerseys you know? yeah. and, and some wonderful connection. And my accountant used to say to me at the end of every, the end of every financial year, so this chunk of money that goes to advertising and sponsorship and promotion, <laughs> where does that go? I says, Melbourne Mustangs. He says, what's that? It's ice hockey. He says, so what do you get for it? I says, hmm, season tickets. And he says, how much are season tickets? <laughs> so I tell him how much season tickets are and how much sponsorship is. And he's standing there scratching his head saying, what are you thinking about? You know what? It's not about the money. No. It's about giving, giving back to school and ice hockey. It's not going to do with money. Um, I, thankfully, it was the naming rights sponsor, Moat Mental Health Services. It was the Moat Melbourne Mustangs for, I don't know, that that was maybe for two seasons. Mm -hmm. Maybe 23, 2013, 2014, or 2014, 2015. But importantly, 2014. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know what happened with the Mustangs I'm, in 2014. I was in attendance. Yes. Absolutely. So was I. And I can't remember the opposition team in the grand final. They weren't travelling too well. I'm thinking it was maybe a 6-1 win or something like that. Yeah, it was 6-1. And I remember two minutes to the end of the game, looking at the clock and, and looking at the score and thinking, can I? Can I start goading them yet? Or is Mr. Fate going to come and slap me in the side of the head and then, you know, Fraser's going to let in six goals? <laughs> what's, the, what's the gig going to be here? Um, but yeah, obviously 2014 was gorgeous. I think with the pandemic, and I think um, a lot of people probably forget that, you know, we also had three months at the start of the year with terrible bushfires, which, mm -hmm. um, you know, leaves a lot of people feeling anxious and, and stuff like that. So I guess um, I'd be really interested to know sort of, you know, you touched on your background with, you know, how, how you've got into it, but I would love to know yeah. how the how Moat started about and sort of maybe what, what drove you to start the company here? Sure. Um, remember the Leslie Fleming story, the chance conversation in the back of your car? This yeah. one kind of sounds the same, <laughs> chance conversation. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I started working over here. So I came over September 20th, 2020. Didn't, didn't work till maybe January the next year or something like that, working in a psych unit, adolescent psych unit down in Clayton. Um, just a psych nurse gig, uh, just to kind of work out the legislation and make sure it was similar to what it was in Scotland. Um, then 2000, end of 2002, I think, um, the nurse unit manager said to me, Brian, it's time for you to go on night shift rotations. And I says, really not happening, Kerry. I'm, I'm not a big fan of doing night shift. And she says, well, everybody's, everybody's got to take their turn. And I says, well, I think it's going to be my turn to look for another job, Kerry, to be perfectly honest. I, I'm not meaning to kind of blackmail you here. It's not the gig. I just, I, I can't do night shift. It, it just sends me nuts. I'm just one of those people. And she was very supportive. And she says, okay, take a few months, see if you can find another job. So I get this wonderful job working with Berry Street. Uh, the, the title was Mental Health Intensive Youth Support, M-H-I-Y-S. So they called that a Miss Worker, M-H-I-Y-S. And what it was, was an outreach mental health worker employed by Southern Health, children and adolescent psych team, but outposted to Berry Street. So Berry Street's one of the larger organizations in Victoria that works with kids in care, yeah? kids yeah. that have been abused. Um, so I was outposted to Berry Street. Their managers weren't my line managers. My line managers were back at Southern Health and the child and adolescent psych team, and they had no idea what I was doing. So it was kind of two years of do what you want, Brian. Mm -hmm. You're an outposted mental health worker. Pretty much do as much or as little as you want. And I adored it. Yes, I, I was going around all these residential care units. So just for people that aren't aware, young people um, being abused, removed from home, put into the care sector, they would often end up in residential care. Now, residential care at that time, it was mostly kids maybe 14 years old and older, mostly. Sometimes you get the younger ones in. But what you've got is a house, ultimately, with maybe three or four of these extremely damaged, extremely vulnerable young people. 
and they're looked after by a group of youth workers who work shift work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they've got morning shifts, afternoon shifts, sleepover shifts. So there, there's somebody looking after these kids kind of 24 seven in the house. But because these kids have been brought up in families where you know, domestic violence is the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, they weren't talking, they weren't taught about impulse control or emotional regulation, social justice, empathy and remorse. You know, these kids are kind of empty, you know, beautiful, beautiful, gorgeous kids, but they didn't have an awful lot of learning as children. Mm -hmm. So I was going in there as an outreach mental health worker, going into the residential unit, maybe turning up at eight o'clock in the morning, having breakfast, uh, when the kids got up, I'm sitting there. <laughs> and I'd hang about for a few hours. And if one of them wanted to talk to me, they would talk to me. If they didn't, they wouldn't. And over time, they would start to recognize me as the Scottish guy that comes to the house and eats our food. And I had a big warning badge on me, you know, mental health clinician, do not talk to this man, you know, because kids in care tend not to want to talk about their issues because their issues are so absolutely enormous, some of them. But over time, they got to know me as the Scottish guy that steals our food and he knows something about sadness and he knows something about being worried and sometimes he can help me. So rather than these kids getting sent to a clinic to go and have a 45 minute session with a psychologist that didn't really engage with them, um, we had the, the clinician going into the house and being part of the structure of the house. So I did that for a couple of years and absolutely loved it. And then at that time I was, where was I living? I think I was living up in Hopper's Crossing. I was living in Hopper's Crossing. So I got a house land package out in Hopper's Crossing uh, after I got the rental in St Kilda Road. So it was a hell of a journey going up and down to Dandenong from, from Hopper's, I'm sure you can see. Um, so I, I decided to try and get another job similar. So I ended up working with the Salvation Army in Sun, Sunshine, or closer to Hopper's Crossing. Um, the same job though, Miss Worker. So I did five years there, maybe, I don't know, 2003, 2008, that kind of window. So for five years, I was doing exactly the same job. Now, when I was there, there was a, a drug and alcohol worker called Steve Marchese, who was as cool as a cool thing, full of coolness. Steve Marchese of Italian descent, you know, strikingly handsome man, um, cool, as, cool as all get out, just a really, really cool, awesome guy and a wonderful drug and alcohol clinician. He went on to study psychology to become a psychologist and in our various conversations you know we were supporting the same clients I, I can clearly remember my, my office was two doors up from Steve Marchese's and I was in Steve's office talking about ice hockey probably mm -hmm. and um, Steve said to me why don't you go self-employed Brian why, why don't you just start doing self-employed work and I said oh, Steve big step mate big step and he says I've started doing it and he says, and if you do it in small steps, you, you can actually still work and be self-employed as well. And I says, how, how does that look? And he says, well, you still do Monday to Friday, nine to five, but then start putting the word out that you're available to do counselling sessions with kids that aren't part of child protection. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can set up a funding structure, set up a business name, a funding structure uh, about how much you would charge for that service. So very much like the Leslie Fleming conversation. And I says, you know what, Steve, yeah, I kind of fancy that. And I asked him for advice, and he gave me lots of advice about, you know, setting up an ABN for the business, business name, website, uh, do a little bit of marketing promotion. So I started off Moat Mental Health Services, but it wasn't called Moat Mental Health Services. It was called Moat, which stood for Mental Health, Mental Health Outreach, Assessment and Therapy. So it was Moat Mental Health Outreach Assessment and Therapy was the original business name. Um, Moat being the water around the castle. I'm guessing you got that. Yeah. So protective water around the castle. Excuse me while I go off on a tangent and I'll come back to this story. Um, quite a few years ago, I had the Moat logo on the back window of my car. It was a big four wheel drive thing. And I had a tradie up at the house, can't remember why. And uh, he came up and knocked on the door and he says, is that your car out the front? I says, yeah. He says, that MOAT thing? I says, yeah, it's my business. He says, are you something to do with the champagne company? Moe. Yeah. I says, no, that's, that's Moat, mate. Moat, water around the castle. Moe Chandon is uh, kind of French champagne. So Moat, mental health outreach assessment and therapy. 
after a few years became Moat Mental Health Services because I'd started doing a range of services. So my initial step out was, I was doing a few hours a week, going to visit families in their homes. So Chris contacts me and says, hey, Brian, I've got a four-year-old kid. We're having real problems with his behavior. Uh, he's not sleeping. He always wants to sleep in bed with me and the missus. Uh, he's really picky about his eating and he throws tantrums a lot. So I would go out to the house and, and catch up with you and your wife and the kid or kids and, and try and help you to help the kid to manage whatever was going on. And over time, the behavior would improve and you would pay for it. Um, so that, that was where the business started. And then the more I was doing that, I, I didn't have to advertise anymore. Word of mouth just went through like wildfire. Um, so I, I became really, really busy doing that. So I started reducing the amount of hours that I was working and increasing the number of hours that I was doing more mental health services. And then child protection started contacting me and saying, hey, Brian, we know the work that you're doing officially is your business, um, but would you be also interested in doing some contract work for us for some other kids in care that, that are falling between the gaps of mental health services? If we paid you at, through mental health services, could you go and see them in the evening or go and see them at the weekends? I thought, yeah, why not? I've not really got that much of a social life, so let's go for it. So I, I suppose I kind of titrated where the, the Sunshine job was up here and Moat was down here. I started going part-time at Sunshine and doing a little bit more Moats. And then just after a while, Moat just took off. Mm -hmm. Now, it didn't take off full-time until 2012. So I was kind of balancing actually various jobs that I had done since Sunshine, balancing them with Moat Mental Health Services and, and just gradually growing Moat Mental Health Services. But the, the way that it turned, I suppose, the most significantly was when organizations started saying to me, Brian, really like the clinical work you're doing with the kids. Can you help us to understand why you do what you do the way you do it? Can you help us to understand these kids and what's going on for them? So then I started developing training packages. Now, this is probably 2004, 2005. I started to develop training packages around mental health. So about mental health awareness, mental health literacy. I became an instructor in mental health first aid, which is probably one of the most well-recognized international um, gold standard of mental health literacy training packages. So I became a trainer in that maybe 2004, 2005, but then also started developing my own training packages. So doing training around depression, anxiety, substance use, um, psychosis, um, self-harming behavior, borderline personality disorder, um, self-care, you know, workers who are working with people with mental illness, how do they do their own self-care? Um, and then I, I started um, working um, around the occupational violence area as well and developed my own occupational violence and aggression training package for hospitals. So I, I suppose the way my, my business increased from 2012 when I went full time to 2020, January and February 2020, because March it kind of changed dramatically, mm -hmm. was that I, I was pretty much doing face-to-face -face training Monday to Friday every day of the year, apart from when I was going on holiday with my family. Um, and that face-to-face that -face training was a range of things. It was either mental health training, mental health first aid, occupational violence and aggression training, or consultancy work in schools, where I was going into primary and secondary schools and, and helping staff to understand the complexity of challenging behaviour, kids with mental health problems, kids from a trauma background. You know what, Chris, I, I, I think I've probably cracked it. I've probably mm -hmm. got the best job in the world. Yeah, yeah? I, I get to do a whole range of different things. Um, Moat Mental Health Services isn't a large organisation. It's me. I'm Moat Mental Health Services. Uh, and my wife, who's the director. <laughs> but, you know, Moat Mental Health boss. Services, this is, yes, yeah, she, <laughs> she's the one that makes the cool decisions. Um, Moat Mental Health Services is just me going out and doing training. And I, I wake up, you know, prior to COVID, I was waking up in the morning thinking, bring it on. Mm -hmm. I'm driving to Yarrawonga. Driving to Yarrawonga, I'm going to leave at 4.30 in the morning. 
going to get to Yarrawonga. I'm going to do a full day of training for Yarrawonga Health Services about occupational violence, and then I'm driving home. Bring it on. <laughs> you know, I'm, I absolutely adore it. I, I like the drive. You know, so I'll do Yarrawonga, I'll do Orbost. Um, I'll, I'll do lots of places, country Victoria, around about Shep, Shepparton area. Do quite a lot in metropolitan Melbourne. That's probably where the majority of my work is. Um, sometimes get invited over to Tasmania, WA. Went up to the Northern Territory, uh, and that was probably last year. Myself and my wife Deb went up there, made a holiday out of it, and a, a couple of days' work, um, doing some training for school staff up in the Northern Territory. Did some conferences, presented conferences over in New Zealand. Did quite a lot of conferences over here mm -hmm. as well, you know, just as a, a keynote speaker, doing workshops, that kind of stuff. But honestly, I, I think I've probably got the best job in the world. Wake up every morning, and I've got work on, and I'm thinking, bring it on. Mm -hmm. Let's go. What does, what does the day have for me? And, and you know, it, it's great that you get paid for it and I get paid well for it and blah, blah, blah. Fascinating. You know, the thing that really spins me is when I get an email. So I, I got an email recently. I can't remember the girl's name. And she said to me, Brian, I attended your mental health training about six years ago and, and I loved it. And it's probably been one of the best training sessions I've ever attended. And I decided then, so this was a youth worker working with kids mm -hmm. in care. I decided then that I wanted to become a psychologist and now I'm a psychologist working in mental health because of your training. You, know, you, you can't put a price on that. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's the kind of feedback that's just absolutely exceptional. So the clinical work that I've done with kids in care for years, just, just absolutely gifted to be able to do it. It's wonderful. Being able to go and pick up a kid in Dandenong, that, that most, most adults, to be perfectly honest, would see this kid as a socially unwashed, feral, horrible kid. 15, 16 year old boy, bit of a gangster, getting into trouble with the cops, you know, using drugs, all that kind of stuff. I get to pick this kid up in Dandenong, put him in my car, drive him to Anglesey, spend the day on the beach in Anglesey with him, drive him back to Dandenong and drop him off at his nan's house. Mm. Fantastic. You know, and, and I got to see that kid in a totally different light because I managed to spend a whole day with them and go down the beach in Anglesey with them and just play mm -hmm. in the water. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just absolutely wonderful. So I, I suppose Moat Mental Health Services for me, the reason that I started it was that Steve Marchese conversation. And one, one thing that really stood out with that conversation was that I, I had a kind of nice car at the time. I can't remember what I was driving, but it was a kind of nice car. And I said to Steve, you know what? I wish I had more money to buy a nicer car. And that's what started this conversation about why don't you go self-employed? You can make a bit of cash. Mm -hmm. I thought, you know what? If I can make enough cash to get myself a nice car, job done. Yeah. Get a nice car, pay the mortgage repayments, pay the bills, feed myself. Mm -hmm. that, that's it. And that's been one of the drivers for me, pardon the pun, is... Um, Having nice cars, <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, so you know, I, again, the accountant will say to me, "Oh, changing your car again, Mr. Jeffrey." And I'll say, well, "You know what? That's what Moat Mental Health Services is about. It's about helping people in society. It's about educating society about mental well-being, and it's about me treat myself nice. You know, the kind of work hard, treat yourself nice, mm -hmm. kind of balance." So Moat Mental Health Services, I've absolutely loved the journey. I suppose one, one of the other big things that happened for me was in 2014, um, Austin Health put out an expression of interest uh, for somebody to take on their occupational violence and aggression training for a three-year contract. Mm -hmm. And I looked at it and I thought, big gig, 8,600 yeah. staff, big gig for one guy to take on. Mm -hmm. And then I looked at the submission and I, I don't know if you've ever done submissions like this, but it's like writing a thesis. It's just an yeah. absolute nightmare. And, you know, all key performance indicators and blah, blah, blah. And I looked at it, and, and I think from memory, you had to pay something like $250. I might have that number wrong, but something like $250 to put in your submission. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I'm not paying $250 just to have a crack at doing that. Mm -hmm. So I spoke to Deb, my wife, about it. And I says, that, that's reckless. That's disgusting that they're asking for money to put in a submission. And the voice of reason, the lovely Deb, said, might be worth it, Brian. You might get the contract. Yeah. And I thought, yeah, okay, I'll go for it. 
So I put in the submission, I secured the contract. That contract was, I think, 50, 52, 50, something like that. 50 days of occupational violence training a year for the Austin, mm -hmm. uh, which is the backbone of my, my business in 2014. Um, so I was 2000, oh, sorry, it started 2015, so the contract was 2014. So my contract was for 2015, 2016, 2017. I'm still doing it in mm -hmm. 2020, and they've signed me up for 2021. And, and again, it's another Leslie Fleming story in it, mm -hmm. that I was thinking about, do I put in a submission or do I not? And the lovely Deb said, yeah, you go. why not? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just absolutely wonderful. So Mont Mental Health Services, thank you very much mm -hmm. for providing me with the, the lifestyle and the opportunities that I've, that I've got. Yeah, it's been yeah. wonderful. I, I do have one question. You know, you, you mentioned that, you know, you have your stepkids that live with you. Mm. Do you ever find the work that you do with kids confronting that, you know, that you do have that kind of a relationship with kids and yeah. you have to go and see these kids, like you said, are looked at or sort of written off by adults mm. in society. I Absolutely. can't imagine how, how difficult that might be. And is that why the work is so rewarding? Because you can, you get to give them that opportunity to change their life or their, li yeah. their life path. Absolutely. So when, when I started doing the work, I, I got some wonderful guidance. Uh, there was actually was a, an English guy. Um, so back in Scotland, when I first became a psych nurse, I was working at Dr. Bernardo's, uh, so a children's home that had a, a school associated with it. There was this English guy called Nigel, as uh, one of the youth workers. And my first day, Nigel took me aside and he said, Brian, don't come in here trying to be their friend. Mm -hmm. Come in here as their mental health worker. Don't come in soft, come in strict. Not nasty, not punitive, just strict. Loving, um, caring, compassionate and strict. He says, if you stick to the rules every day of the week and twice on Tuesday, these kids will blossom because of that. Yeah. And it was the best advice I've ever had in my career. So I, I am, I'm a strict person. You know, ask Paddy in Georgia, they'll tell you. Um, but very fair mm -hmm. and compassionate, caring and loving. And my beliefs and values come from my mum. You know, that, that's the way she brought us up, a very strict childhood. So that, that became part of the structure of why I wanted to work with these kids. And I honestly believed that if I could provide them with stability at some point in their life, that that would help them to go on and develop. And it, it proved to be true. You know, all the research around child and adolescent psychiatry suggests that, that stability is what's missing for these kids. And a firm, consistent, loving, caring, nurturing environment is the best thing for them. So not having any kids of my own, in, in 2010, when Deb and I decided to start living together and, and Paddy and George have been part of that family, you know, it was a tough call. It really was a tough call. You know, love Deb to bits, lo love the kids. They're just they're absolutely glorious kids. Thank you to Melbourne Mustangs for that, and I'll pick up on that shortly. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, these, these kids are absolutely fantastic. And the, the way I've done my work is that I've, I've had to be really ruthless mm -hmm. in that at the end of the day at work, it's the end of the day. That's what it is. When, when I'm driving home and I'm starting to think about all these kids, and oh, Sam said that to me, and Angie said that to me, and Eddie said that to me, I, I just learned over time, you've got to block it. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So at the end of every single working day, I, I, I take account of how the day's gone. I debrief myself on how the day's gone. I write myself any notes about what I need to pick up tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And I leave those not, notes at the workplace, and I drive home. And by the time I get home, I've kind of trained myself to debrief. So when I get home and see Paddy in Georgia, I, I'm not thinking about kids in care. But you know, one, one of the things about my value and belief structure is that I've brought up my stepkids with, with Deb, of course, but my side of that has been a really strict, loving, caring, compassionate, firm kind of leader, firm kind of parent, because I genuinely believe that that's what helps kids to develop. Mm -hmm. You know, you see parents who want to be their kid's best friend, you know, want to go drinking with their kids from they're 14 and share drugs with their kids, and, you know, don't, don't impose any rules on their kids and, oh, just let them do whatever they want. I'm sure they'll not come to any damage. Um, and I suppose for me, my training and my experience with these kids in care has helped me to, to be, I think, quite a balanced parent. 
So that, that separation, that overlap, it, it's, not, it's not as severe as, as people might think. But I think that's because of the self-discipline of mm -hmm. I never bring work home with me. Certainly not the clinical work. You know, I bring some of the training work home and the invoicing work home. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I try not to bring the clinical work home. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's been my protection. And, you know, seeing the trajectory that some of these kids have been on, and, and thankfully with the wonderful services that surround these kids, seeing them taking beautiful turnings and, and really progressing against all odds, just gives me so much satisfaction to see that. But it also gives me so much confidence that I know that our kids, Paddy and Georgia, are going to go on and kick goals mm -hmm. in, in whatever area they end up in. You know, really very, very functional human beings. Mm -hmm. So I, I suppose I've got lots of people to thank for that. And the first person is my mum because of the way she brought me up. And then that guy, at Bernardo's, Nigel, the English dude, mm -hmm. he, he really helped enormously just in planting those seeds about what, what do we need to do? You know, what yeah. do we need to do in society to bring up kids properly? Yeah. I'd be interested to know how you found teaching adults because a lot of times what you do see is with kids, when they're raised a certain way, they don't necessarily realize these things are issues mm. until they sort of get to, you know, those adult years where you look back and you go, shit, that's not normal or that's not, that's not how things, but unfortunately that's, you know, exactly how you were raised and it's all you, you've known. Yeah. How have you found, you know, sort of meeting people in like a professional work sense? And sort of teaching them has have you experienced pushback or have you experienced any issues with people you know when you sort of trying to uh, place onto your training methods onto them yeah yep um thankfully um in, in australia you know where i've done all my training that there's this novelty thing of being the scottish guy first of all right which which absolutely helps as an educator having mm -hmm. the funny accent helps as an educator being a registered psychiatric nurse with 25 years of experience working with kids in care carries an awful lot of weight. Now, I'm actually conflicted about this because I think the best people to work with kids in care are people who work in residential care. You know, these people are the absolute gold in our society. It's like foster carers, absolute gold dust. Wonderful, wonderful people. What they lack is a bit of the foundation knowledge that I learned, not at university, to be perfectly clear. You know, three years at university doesn't really teach you an awful lot, <laughs> but the, the 25 years thereafter. So me helping these people to understand a little bit more depth of knowledge from my experience, I think the fact that I've been doing it for so long carries a bit more weight than perhaps it should, to be perfectly honest. And, and what I mean by that is, when I, when I go into a meeting with an organisation, uh, I'll maybe speak to some team leaders about some of the issues they're having with some of the kids. And the team leaders are saying, Brian, we've been to the executive, the directors, and we've said we want to go this way, but they just don't take it seriously. And I'll say, well, why do you want to go that way? What's your thinking? And we'll, we'll brainstorm it. And then I'll go and speak to the directors, the executive, and I'll say exactly what the team leaders have said. And they take it on board because I'm saying yeah. it. You know, and I, I'm, I'm really conflicted about that because it shouldn't be like that. You know, it's like when I come to Chris's house to work with Chris's kids, I'm going to say exactly the same thing to your kids that you've mm -hmm. said, but they'll listen to me because I'm yeah. the guy. You know, so there's a, there's a bit of that in the training as well, is that people assume, rightly or wrongly, that I know what I'm talking about. Um, I, I deliver my training. For anybody who's ever seen my training, I've, I've done some kind of free webinar stuff and things recently. Um, I deliver my training hopefully in a way that demystifies and destigmatizes mental illness. And I actually deliver it in a very similar way to the way I deliver it to kids. So, you know, some, I don't know, Chris, if you've ever done mental health training of any sort, but some people that deliver mental health training, they get, they get in, into these stupid big words and, mm -hmm. you know, get into all the jargon and, and you know, there's absolutely no need for it. You know, start talking about, you know, the prefrontal cortex and what cortisol does to this. And, you know, nobody's interested in that. But what we need is to really simplify it so that people mm -hmm. can use the information. So the, the goal in my training is that you come in with a bit of knowledge and you go out with either a reinforcement of that knowledge or another couple of tools in your toolbox. 
And I, I, I've not had an awful lot of pushback, which was your question. Um, now, I don't want to sound like I'm great at my job. That's, but hopefully that's not the way this comes across. But there have been a couple of people over the years that have criticised my training. Mm-hmm. But they, they stand out as exceptions, really. Yeah. You know, there, there was one person, that, probably best not name the organisation. <laughs> there was one person at a drug and alcohol rehabilitation service where I'd done quite a lot of training. And he'd written in his evaluation form, um, I didn't believe any of your stories. What you're talking about, drug and alcohol, is wrong. And that's what he put in the evaluation form. And I thought, all of the clinical stories I tell in my training are obviously true stories, you know, it's to consolidate the learning. But this guy had been so convinced that it was all lies. There there was another one, there was a a hospital staff member put in her evaluation form. She's an emergency department nurse. And we're talking about occupational violence. And she marked me down the evaluation form and said, how dare you try and teach us about occupational violence? We work in the emergency department. We know what we're doing. Now, the other 4,200 evaluations from that hospital have all been glowing, and Mm -hmm. this one stands out. And I suppose the way I look at that is I take feedback. You know, maybe I I came across as patronizing in that session, perhaps. Or maybe that person was having a really bad day. Yeah, I I think that's why feedback's unavoidable. Like you, yeah, when, when yeah. you think about, especially from, and correct me if I'm wrong in this, but you know, you're not dealing with a broken arm. Mm. Like, you know, you can't, you, you, there's a very difficult way to sort of diagnose what works or what doesn't work because everyone's different. So I yeah. think th- it doesn't matter sort of how many of these sessions you do or you don't do, there mm. is always going to be sort of that feedback from one or two people like this who are, who may have completely misread your message because they didn't like the way it was delivered. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so it doesn't happen often. Um, you know, it takes the wind out of my sails, to be honest. You know, I'm like mm-hmm. everybody else, so I'm kind of sensitive to criticism. Um, but once I've sat and thought about it and reflected on it, then I can usually take out what it was they were meaning from it. Yeah. Um, so thankfully, there's not an awful lot of pushback from the training. Um, most people are embracing it because they're just so glad to get somebody that can help them. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's that's what it's been about. Yeah. One thing I do want to I do want to ask you is about this sort of last few months we've been experiencing mm-hmm. in Victoria or in metropolitan Melbourne specifically. You know, you've mentioned that how you know how much impact, say, picking a kid up, taking them to the beach, hanging out with them for the day has been. Mm. How have you found that you know having to reach out to people over a Zoom chat or you know? not having that face-to-face sort of a experience, how do you find that, A, how has that changed the way you've approached things? And B, Mm -hmm. do you think that there has been um, any sort of, any impacts on the, from a client point of view? Absolutely. Um, That's a big one. That's a whole session itself. Um, You know, the, 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 the big one for me is that as a clinician, for the majority of the time, I was still able to go out and catch up with clients. So over recent years, I haven't done much client work at all because the training's just been going gangbusters. Um, but one of the, the nice things, I suppose, about COVID, COVID ended, you know, mental health services, maybe April. I didn't have any work on at all uh, because it was all face-to-face training and it was all getting cancelled. But it let me go back on the tools again and go back and do the clinical work in foster families. Mm-hmm. So I was going out to foster families who would normally wait maybe three and a half months to get an appointment with a clinician. And when, when the organization phoned me and said, when can you go and visit this foster kid? I'd say, how's tomorrow afternoon looking for you? Yeah. You know, so it was, it was just, it was great. There's been an awful lot of clients who have had to resort to this thing that we're doing, this remote contact thing. And it's, it, it can't be as good. It can't be as effective mm-hmm. as you actually being in the room with a person. It's a, a lot better than nothing. Uh, mm-hmm. And some people actually prefer it. They prefer the disconnection of it. So there's that audience as well. But I think for the majority of people, they are missing out on that direct human contact. Mm-hmm. One of my concerns about the whole COVID period is that people have been removing themselves from their norm. So, you know, whatever your job was pre-COVID, you'd get up in the morning, you'd have your shower, you'd get your work clothes on, you'd have your breakfast. You know, you watch 10 minutes of the news before you went out to work. Can you go and do an honest day's work? You come home again, 
catch up with the family, have a shower, have dinner, watch some telly, go and play football, you know, whatever. There was a standard routine for everyone. Mm-hmm. During COVID, with people working from home, it changed. Yeah. People aren't getting up and showering and getting the work clothes. They're pulling on the, the pajamas and the Ugg boots. And, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not watching news for 10 minutes before they go to work. They've got ABC news channel on for the whole day talking about mm-hmm. COVID numbers. And you're just getting overwhelmed with COVID, COVID, yeah. people are dying, you know, for the whole day. And because you're grazing all day, drifting into the kitchen and eating biscuits all day, when it comes to dinner time with the family at night, where you would traditionally get together in some families, it's not happening. No. People aren't hungry. People don't want to talk. Mm-hmm. You know, so one of the things for me about this whole COVID period has been this disconnection of, of human connection is one of the biggest things I'm concerned about. And we need to reconnect. Mm-hmm. And um, for me, the best way we can reconnect is by turning the clock back to February 2020. Mm-hmm. Have a look at all the variables that were happening in your world in 2020. Mm-hmm. See which ones are missing and put them back in. Yeah. You know, because the, the, the level of stress in society has gone daft. Mm-hmm. The amount of people on social media, and you know what, I'm as guilty as anybody else, but the amount of people on social media that are throwing rocks other people because of their views of politics or Dan Andrews or is COVID a real thing and all the rest of it. The amount of hate that's out it's there. It's overwhelming. It is, but I think it's because everybody's got cabin fever. Well, not everybody because a lot of people are still out there working. Mm-hmm. But those people who have just been, you know, living like hermits for seven months, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, so- something's going to pop there. So for me, I'm expecting to be really busy next year. Mm-hmm. I think men- mental health is, is going to have a, a new birth next year. I'm hoping that lots and lots of funding comes from the government to start yeah. up new programs. Um, for, not, not just for guys, not just for kids in care, not just for, you know, for victims everyone. of domestic violence. Straight across the board. Old mm-hmm. people, young people, people with two heads, even Melbourne mm-hmm. Ice fans. Melbourne Ice fans as well. <laughs> mental health for yeah. them. Absolutely everyone. Um, that's where I hope it goes. But yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm equally concerned, Chris, that, um, that this period has had an effect. Mm-hmm. But you know what? When you look over the history of the human race, we've hit speed bumps before. Yeah. And you know, in four years, we're going to look back at 2020 and say, wow, yeah. wasn't that interesting? Remember the whole Trump thing and the COVID thing? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and hopefully most of us will be able to look back on it with a smile. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a, an incredible point is that I think we are starting to see, um, I think especially my demographic and in terms of males, uh, you know, sort of 25 to 35, typically mm. aren't usually the best talkers. But what yeah. you are seeing is now is there is so much more encouragement for that. And I think there is a an encouragement for uh, people just in all demographics to speak about their mental health. Mm. and um you know i completely agree like i live alone like mm-hmm. uh, like I, I can't lie like that it's been a difficult it's been a difficult like period you know there are some mm. there are some days or you know i remember i remember a weekend where i you know pretty much didn't get out i didn't i didn't really get out of bed like mm. i got out of bed to get food and then i went back i had no you know motivational drive and i think I think it's the one thing that I've taken out of this and I've tr- I try to look at it from a, a positive view because it's very easy to go like, oh, what the fuck was that year? Mm. Like, but, you know, I, I try and just do something completely different, whether that's, you know, whether that's watching an old movie or an old TV show that, you know, yeah. brings back some kind of nostalgia or positive memories. And, you know, all of a sudden you're, you know, you're in sort of a better frame of mind and then you, then you're like, oh, I might go take a walk. And yeah. it, it's, it's been very easy to get sort of completely stuck mm, in yeah. sort, of, uh, sort of where you are. And like there are times where I, I just haven't been able to find that. So, uh, I mean, I can, I think it's safe to say that I hope, I hope you are busy and I hope all, you know, all sort of mental health workers and services like this are busy because so many people for, uh, a number of different reasons have been affected by this. And, you know, it's not something that it's not something where you can just go like, all right, we're back. 
we're back open. Life is life is great. Like you have to look at the ripple effects on, you know, how it's affected people. Small business owners will, mm. you know, will be working years, you know, years to recover financially from this. So, um, it it is a. I think it is really important to. It's obviously very important to, for us to get back to a normal life, but I think a lot of people will probably need uh, a helping hand to, yeah. to sort of get back there. Absolutely. And, you know, that's it's really important, Chris, because it affects everyone. And, you know, one of the things that blew me away, I was wanting to talk about the Mustang, so I suppose there's a bit of segue here. What, one of the things that blew me away about my connection with the Mustangs was that my kids, Paddy and Georgia, at 10, 7 years old, as they were then, looked up to the Mustangs as demigods, Mm -hmm. quite rightly, yeah? Um, And for good reason, which I'll I'll give you an example of in a moment. Um, But one of the things that I provided for the Melbourne Mustangs as part of my sponsorship was I I said to the club, if any of the guys need any counselling, you know, performance anxiety or anything like that, I'm here, yeah? You can come to my house, uh, come into this office right here. Uh, We can sit down, we can talk about whatever it is you need to talk about, you know, free counselling for any Mustang. And I thought, well, that, that's going to be easy. These guys are demigods. They won't have kind of day-to-day problems. Mm-hmm. How naive of a mental health worker to think that people at an elite level of any sport aren't going to have problems. Yeah. But Mustangs kept me busy. Mm-hmm. Just like any other hockey team would or any other sporting team would. And it was a wonderful opportunity for my kids to see their demigods arriving at the front door and coming in to spend an hour with me in the office. And my kids know what I do for a job. They know why the guys are here, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then we'd maybe, maybe go out and grab a pizza with the kids and have a laugh before they went home again. And it was just a wonderful opportunity um, to, to remind my kids, but everyone, that mental health doesn't discriminate. It doesn't give a no. crap whether you're good at skating or not. Mm-hmm. It, it's going to visit everyone. Now, now, one of the clubs in the AIHL that's right into this is CBR Brave. Mm-hmm. The, the mental health profile that CBR Brave have got is enormous. The amount of work they are doing, you know, the Movember kind of stuff and everything else. Mm-hmm. Now, it's, it's one player in particular that's driving that as far as I'm aware, but the whole club has embraced it. That's Melbourne Mustangs. You know, the, the Melbourne Mustangs, the conversations I've had with them over the years about, you know, how do we connect with people in the community? How do we make sure that, you know, our, our club is open to members of, of every community? Mm-hmm. It's been great conversations. But I, I suppose just, I, I was thinking there about this idea that my kids look up to these guys, right? Now, I, I can't name all of the Mustangs and none of them are better than the rest, but some of them have been absolute standouts in our family's existence. Now, Pat O'Kane, everybody knows Pat O'Kane, right? So Pat O'Kane is just the most gorgeous guy. Mm-hmm. Um, five foot seven professional hockey player. You don't get many of them, that doesn't. I think no. Jason's about five foot eight. Yeah. Um, so and Pat came over, I don't know when that was, 2013, 2014, whenever, and became part of our life and still is part of our life. He's just a wonderful, wonderful guy. But there was a, a story that I tell frequently. Um, so this must be 2000 and... 12 maybe something like that we had we had this guy from vancouver came over jake ebner played number 61 from memory and ollie wren was the goalie and and the two of them were kind of average hockey players over there i'm sure but they were pretty good over here mm-hmm. as in was pretty good not the best but pretty good my my son paddy then um was about nine years old, 10 years old, something like that. And it was his birthday coming up. And the guys were up playing in Brisbane that weekend. And Jake had said to Paddy, what are you doing for your birthday, the birthday weekend? And Paddy says, oh, me and my mates are going skating at the ice house. And Jake and Ollie came back from the Brisbane game on the Sunday in Mm -hmm. time to come and have a skate with Paddy and his mates on the Sunday night um, at the, the ice house. And they, they had a skate with them. I think they were still wearing their jerseys, <laughs> stinking yeah. jerseys. And, and Jake said to Paddy, it's your birthday today. And Paddy said, no, it's Tuesday or whenever it is. And Jake says, what are you doing Monday night? And Paddy says, a oh, school night. And Jake says, do you think your, your mum and Brian would let me and Ollie come over on Monday night? Mm-hmm. And Paddy says, can I ask? So he asked us and he says, yeah, of course. 
So Jake Ebner and Ollie Wren came over and had a movie night with Paddy for his birthday and slept mm-hmm. over. Now, that, that, that kind of thing doesn't happen in other sports. You know, the no. connection between the fan base and the elite athletes, the demigods, mm-hmm. in Australian Ice Hockey League is just gorgeous. Now, that's a Mustang story, but it's not a Mustang story. That's a Australian Ice Hockey story. Yeah. You know, that makes, that makes such wonderful. a difference. It's, yeah. it's moments like that that I don't think... Well, I do, to some, to some regard, I think that the, the athletes and the players do know the impact they're going to have, but I don't think they probably understand the full impact. Mm. And, you know, he, he could, Paddy could very well go on and, you know, play for the Mustangs, maybe play for Australia. Yeah. And someone like me can sit down and ask him about his career and he'll go, oh, yeah, when I was nine, you know, I, lo- yeah. I, looked, up to these, I looked up to these guys and this is what they did. That then, that creates, and I spoke about this on the, the, the last episode that I'm airing this week, um, you know, you can look at it, you can take the narrow-minded view of you have made an impact with one person. Yeah. When that one person has an impact on another person and then it goes on, that's a cycle that you could essentially say, I started this. Mm. And that, you know, you're sending that, that there's no limits to where that can go. So I think it's really important with a smaller sport in a country to have that sort of interaction with yeah. The fans. Yeah. And, and just I mean, another example of that, because of what you just said there. Uh, so Paddy's playing hockey now, plays in the same team as me, which is kind of cool. Um, the but in twi- <laughs> <laughs> The Rebels. Yeah. yeah Star Wars team. Yeah. Um, so um, Paddy and I play in the Rebels um, just now. Oh, not just now, but hopefully 30th of November. Beer League stand Thanks again, Christ. hopefully. Um, so anyway... Um, 2011, when the Mustangs did their first serious season after their exhibition year, uh, Benny Grant was one of the guys. He didn't really get a, a big run with the team, but gorgeous guy. Mm-hmm. A young guy, really, really young guy. Played number 27. At the first game, first home game, uh, so Paddy's just a, a really young kid, and George is a really young kid. Um, so we are at the, the venue after the game, uh, when the team come in. We're all having dinner together and having a chat, and the team would come up and chat to us. And, and Benny Grant came up to the table, introduced himself to Paddy. So I'm Benny Grant, number 27. He says, do you want to come and meet the rest of the team? And Paddy's face just lit up. Mm-hmm. So he got a programme and a pen, and he took Paddy around every team member and got an autograph, an inter- yeah. introduction with every team member. Paddy came back. Ever since, where possible, Paddy has played number 27. Mm-hmm. That, that's his number, and that'll be his number whenever he's playing hockey. If he gets a choice of a number... He yeah. automatically says 27, <laughs> and that's Benny Grant. You know, yeah. So it's just an, another example of, of how one genuine moment mm-hmm. goes on and lights up a kid's life and, and puts Paddy on a path, an awesome path that he's on just now. Um, and a lot of that comes down to good luck mm-hmm. and some good decisions. Um, I mean, Mustangs, Melbourne Ice, you know, the, the, the whole community, there's a, there's a lot to be said for that. There's yeah. a lot of gratitude for that. Yeah, exactly. And I think in a, in a very roundabout way, you can look at sort of the work that you do is similar in some aspect. You know, you're giving, you're essentially giving a kid who's obviously in a, had a very different experience, mm. but you're giving them a positive moment or a moment where they can sort of, you know, go, maybe I haven't experienced this before. And then they take off in another direction um and you know it's a, it's essentially the same thing so when you if you think about it in kind of a weird weird sense that i've sort of listed it so it's like you you never really know the full impact that you're going to have and i can understand why you you know you you touch on how much you love what you do when you can sort of see firsthand the impact you make especially to a young kid yeah um it's you know, it's hard. It would be hard for anyone to not sort of go, you know, have their boots hit the ground when they wake up in the morning and go, "Let's get stuck into work today." Yeah, yeah, totally. And I mean, that again takes us back to where we started with the Leslie Fleming conversation in the back of the car on the mm-hmm. way home from Glasgow. Chance conversation that's that's made this happen. Yeah, you know, with, without that conversation with Leslie Fleming in 1992, this this conversation wouldn't be happening. So it's. Um, it's enormous. Yeah, no, I think that's um, that's a, a really good way to finish. And 
I, I just want to thank you, Juan, for, for, for giving us a little bit of background on you and, you know, sort of your journey here and also for touching on the, the work that you do because, uh, look, uh, you're, I will admit you're a better man than me. Uh, that sort of work would, you know, seeing that from at such a young age would really probably take a, a bit of a, a hard line in me and sort of be harder for me to not bring home. So um, mm. I can't thank people like you enough for what you do and for the, the lives you impact and will continue to impact. So thank you very much for, for coming on to tell a story and for doing everything that you do. Thank you very much, Chris. Thanks. That's lovely words. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity to, to be part of your podcast. Um, I'm, I'm available. You know, if people want to make contact with me, you know, my mm -hmm. business is moats, moat.com.au, go on my website. Mm -hmm. any, any questions about mental health? Yep. I'm more than happy to answer emails. Don't phone me, just mm -hmm. email me. Just, um, yeah. But you know Perfect. what, see, see if any of the people that are watching this just now are thinking about depression, thinking about suicide, thinking about a family member that's got bipolar disorder, anything like that, if there's any confusion, drop me an email, brian, mm -hmm. B-R-Y-A-N, at moats.com.au. More than happy Perfect. to help out. Thank yeah, you very much, yeah. Chris. We'll get all your contact details for the for yourself and for the company in, into the episode, so that you know if anyone does need to reach out for whatever reason, um, we've got that information handy. Awesome. Thank you. No worries. Thank you very much.